Hello brothers and sisters in Christ, <clears throat> welcome back to my channel. Um, today we're going to carry on with Daniel chapter 11. And um, just before we go on, can I just ask you if you wouldn't mind subscribing to my channel, smashing the like button and sharing my videos with family and friends. And um, just if you wouldn't mind, if you'd like to just drop a comment, I'd love to hear from you in the comment section. And um, yeah, it just helps if you subscribe and hit the like button for the YouTube algorithm to get the videos out to as many people and to get the gospel of Jesus Christ out to a broken world. So, now without much more to do, um, let's have a look at our Bible and listen to the audio of chapter 11. Chapter 11. Also I, in the first year of Darius, the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. And now will I shew thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. And a mighty king shall stand up, that shall rule with great dominion, and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken, and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven, and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others beside those. And the king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him, and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. And in the end of years they shall join themselves together, for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement, but she shall not retain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand, nor his arm, but she shall be given up, and they that brought her, and he that begat her, and he that strengthened her in these times. But out of a branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate, which shall come with an army, and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north, and shall deal against them, and shall prevail, and shall also carry captives into Egypt their gods, with their princes, and with their precious vessels of silver and of gold, and he shall continue more years than the king of the north. So the king of the south shall come into his kingdom, and shall return into his own land. But his sons shall be stirred up, and shall assemble a multitude of great forces, and one shall certainly come, and overflow, and pass through. Then shall he return, and be stirred up, even to his fortress. And the king of the south shall be moved with choler, and shall come forth and fight with him, even with the king of the north. And he shall set forth a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into his hand. And when he hath taken away the multitude, his heart shall be lifted up, and he shall cast down many ten thousands. But he shall not be strengthened by it. For the king of the north shall return, and shall set forth a multitude greater than the former, and shall certainly come after certain years with a great army, and with much riches. And in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. So the king of the north shall come, and cast up a mount, and take the most fenced cities, and the arms of the south shall not withstand, neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. But he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him. And he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. He shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom, and upright ones with him, thus shall he do. And he shall give him the daughter of women, corrupting her, but she shall not stand on his side, neither be for him. After this shall he turn his face unto the isles, and shall take many. But a prince for his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease. Without his own reproach, he shall cause it to turn upon him. Then he shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall, and not be found. Then shall stand up in his estate a razor of taxes in the glory of the kingdom. But within few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom. But he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. And with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him, and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. And after the league made with him he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. 
He shall enter peaceably, even upon the fattest places of the province, and he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey, and spoil, and riches. Yea, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds, even for a time. And he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army. But he shall not stand, for they shall forecast devices against him. Yea, they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him, and his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. And both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. Then shall he return into his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant, and he shall do exploits, and return to his own land. At the time appointed he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter, for the ships of Chitim shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return, and have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many. Yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil many days. Now when they shall fall, they shall be open with a little help. But many shall plead to them with flatteries, and some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge, and to make them white, even to the time of the end. Yet it is yet for a time appointed. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that, that is determined, shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and the God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver, and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for gain. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots, and with horsemen, and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries, and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy, and utterly to make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. Okay, folks, let's have a look at a chart I've got just before we go into my notes. So it's quite self explanatory. Okay, so it's starts here and we'll see that it's a reference in Daniel 8 okay of the ram and the two horns but it's a more detailed reign of the kings of Persia coming down from when Babylon is taken by the Persian Empire down to the decree that is given to build the walls of Jerusalem. Okay, so that's there and then it covers the Greek Empire and Alexander the Great's reign which correlates to Daniel 8 okay and that has got reference 
to the goat with the great horn and then it steps into the division of Alexander the Great's empire into the four um, territories governed by his commanders and this is where we need to look at more detail in this particular chapter. So now let's start from verse 1 and work our way through and unpack it so that we can get some sort of idea. So the introduction here, I'm just going to say that this chapter contains one of the most successful or successfully speculative, speculative fulfilled prophecies of the Bible. It, pre it predicts history over 375 years and then also it also predicts the end part of the world with amazing accuracy, okay. including the reign, the rise and reign of the Antichrist. The chapter is so specific that many critics who deny supernatural revelation, okay, have said that this cannot be written before the events took place. Okay, so there's a school of thought that this is a flawed, fraudulently claim to prophecy. But let's have a look and rightly divide the word of truth and we will see how accurate this book is. The first section we're going to look at, and that covers verse 2, is the division of the Greek Empire. Okay, so it's the four kings. Verse 2 says, And now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up against the realm of Greece. Okay, so here we see simply that the angel told Daniel that there would be three more kings in Persia until the fourth arose. Okay, so if we look here, three more kings before the fourth one. King Xerxes invades Greece. Okay, so there's one, two, three. So this is the history or the account of these kings here of Persia reigning until King Xerxes comes on the scene. Then the fourth king will be strong, rich and opposed to the realm of Greece. Okay, the strong rich fourth king will fulfill, uh, was fulfilled in the Persian king Xerxes. So the fourth shall be far richer. Okay, so let's break that down. In fulfillment, there are actually four kings in the time of Daniel until he spoke of Xerxes. Okay, the one who stirred up against the realm of Greece. So King Xerxes okay, challenged the realm of Greece or the Greek Empire when he was king of Persia. Either the king sorry, either the angel omitted the current king Cyrus Okay, 
looking only to the future, or he ignored King Semdus of Persia because he ruled less than one year and was an imposter to the throne. Okay, so we need to look here. Let's go back to my chart here. So either the angel ignored Cyrus and he counted one, two, three, four. Okay. Or he actually omitted this kingdom here because it was less than a year of reigning. So both ways we see we've got four kingdoms or four kings in control of Persia before King Xerxes arises and rules Persia. Okay. So these visions and insights are regarding the future of the Persian and Greek empires. Okay. They are relevant because each empire attempts to wipe out the people of God at the same time. Okay. So that's why Daniel has this vision and he puts this into perspective because it's dealing with God's people and the persecution of these nations against God's people. Okay. The Persian Empire tried to wipe out the Jewish people during the reign of Xerxes, though the, through the plot of Haman, which is related to the book of Esther. So, actually, the book of Esther, okay, is a account where the Jewish people are subject to a near annihilation by Haman. Okay. But if it wasn't for Esther and her uncle who persuaded Esther to go before the king of Persia okay, and to plead the case of the Jewish people. Okay, so Mordecai and Esther, right, they motivated a plea before the Persian king in the book of Esther to save the Jewish people that Haman had constructed or orchestrated a conspiracy against them to be all put to death. Then, in the Greek Empire, they also tried to wipe out the Jewish people during the reign of Artaxerxes, or Antiochus, sorry, Antiochus. Now, Antiochus is probably the closest reign to the Antichrist in the future. So when we look at Daniel's prophecies, we've got to remember that the prophecies and the visions that are given around Antiochus, the Epiphanes, okay, both in chapter 8 and chapter 9, and chapter 11, they are prophecies that are split in two. They partially fulfilled 
in Daniel's time. Okay, and pretty close to Daniel's, just after Daniel died. And will be also a reference for future prophecies to take place. Okay, towards the end time. So, let's read verse 3 and 4. The rise, the rise of a mighty king. Then a mighty king shall arise, and who shall rule with who shall rule with great domination, um, and do according to his will. And when he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken up and divided towards the four winds of heaven, but not amongst his prosperity nor according to his dominion with which he ruled for his kingdom shall be uprooted even for others besides these okay so here we need to let's unpack it quite nicely here the angel told Daniel of a mighty king with a great dominion okay first of all but then his kingdom would not endure. He also tells him in this couple of verses. He also then goes on, the angel, and says it would be divided after the death of the mighty king. So, here we see this is fulfilled in Alexander the Great's reign. Okay, so here when the angel talks about the mighty king shall rise, he's referring to Alexander the Great. Right? Then, when he talks about it will not endure, that is the sudden death of King Alexander at the age of 32. And then subsequently after his death, Okay, the angel says that the empire will be divided after the mighty king. So now this is the division that the Greek empire undertakes under the four generals of Alexander. Now, Alexander died at the age of 32 after a fever got hold of him after a drunken party in Babylon. So here, this prophet, prophecy does not mainly concern Alexander because he did no harm to Jerusalem. So we've got to remember that. Okay. Alexander the Great didn't invade Jerusalem or anything like that. The trouble for Jerusalem and the Jews came after his death. Now, here is a wonderful part of what Josephus and his antiquities of the Jews his book in chapter 8 says that here he records an in, the interesting, interesting arrival of Alexander the Great to Jerusalem and how he was shown the book of Daniel by the high priest okay, now who Alexander had seen previously in a vision. Now, Alexander had a vision, okay, of his reign previously, and he saw this high priest. And Alexander was so impressed that he spared Jerusalem and granted it religious toleration. Okay, so under his rule, 
he granted religious toleration for Jerusalem and the city and the temple. And now we read of how it happened, and I'm going to read it as clearly, um, but as quickly as I can. It said, And when he understood that he was not far from the city, this is Alexander the Great, he went out in procession with the, um, with the priests and the multitude of citizens. And pros the procession was venerable and the manner of it different from that of other nations. The approaching army, sorry, let's just back up. This is the actual high priest that goes out, not Alexander. Uh, the approaching army thought they would have the liberty to plunder the city and torment the high priest to death, which the king's displeasure fairly promised them. And every reverse of it happened. For Alexander, when he saw the multitudes in the distance, in white robes, while the priest stood clothed with fine linen, the high priest in purple and scarlet clothing, with his mitre on his head, having gold, having a golden plate, which the name of God was engraved on, he approached by himself and adored that name, and first saluted the high priest. The Jews also did all together with one voice salute Alexander and encompass him about, whereupon the kings of Syria and the rest were surprised at Alexander, what, a, what Alexander had done, and supposed him disordered in his mind. However, Parimon alone went up to him and asked him, that was one of his generals, how it came to pass that when all others ordered, adored him, he should adore the high priest of the Jews. To him he replied, I did not adore him, but that God who hath honoured him with that high priesthood. For I saw this very person in a dream, in this very habit, when I was at Dios in Macedonia. So in Macedonia, Alexander the Great had a vision and he saw this high priest and he saw the God of the high priest. And here in reality he sees this high priest was clothed exactly the same as in his vision, and he realizes that the God of this high priest has to be honored. I saw this very person in my dream. Okay, sorry, let's get going. When I was considering with myself how I might obtain dominion over Asia, exhorted me to take to make no delay but boldly to pass over the sea thither for that he would conduct his army and would give me the dominion over the Persians whence it is that having seen no other in that habit and now seeing this person in it and remembering the vision and the exhortation which I had in my dream, I believe that I bring this army under the divine con the divine conduct and shall theref therewith conquer Darius and destroy the power of the Persians, and that all things will succeed according to what this in my in my own mind. Okay. So here we see that Alexander the Great confirms his vision 
that he had. Okay, and he firmly believes that if he honors and leaves Jerusalem alone, he will destroy Darius, the king of the Persians. Okay. So now, not amongst his posterity, after Alexander's death, one of his descendants succeeded him. It wasn't for lack of trying. Alexander did leave three possible heirs to the kingdom. Okay. A half-brother named Philip, who was, a, who was mentally okay, deficient. And then the second one was a son who was born after Alexander had died. And then there was an illegitimate son named Hercules. So the half-brother and the posthumous son of the first designated co-monarchs, each with a regent. But fighting amongst the regents eventually resulted in the murder of all possible heirs. So that is the background, the backstory of Alexandra's heirs. Okay. So through all sorts of disputes, they end up all being murdered and divided towards the four kings of heaven after the death of Alexandra's possible heirs. Four of the generals controlled the in Greek Empire. But none of them, according to Alexander's dominion. Okay. So none of them, none of these four, were actually allocated to rule. Because he had one of those four heirs that were murdered to rule. The rest of the prophecy now focuses on two of the four inheritors of Alexander's realm and one of the dynasties that they established. Only two are focused on because they consistently fought over now the promised land because it sat between their centers of power. So now we've got to understand. Let's read now because these are four generals ruling over the known world of the Greek Empire and each are subject to an area of rule. The kings of the north and the kings of the south, the strength of the kings of the south. So yeah, also the king of the south shall become strong, as well as one of his princes, and he shall gain power over him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. The king of the south shall be strong. One of the four inheritors of the empire, of the mighty king, would become stronger and greater than the others. Okay. Then we also have a look at, we shall gain power over him and have dominion. Okay. This, okay, it was fulfilled in Potrami, one of Egypt, who exerted his control over the Holy Land soon after the division of the empire, and the Potramis dominated this area. Okay. So now we need to understand Potramis was one of Alexander's great generals, 
and his division of the Greek Empire was to rule the area of Egypt. Okay. But he also exerted his control over the Holy Land. So he also wanted to have part of the Holy Land. Okay. So Potomi had a prince named Salilus who rose to power and took dominion over the region of Syria. He became more powerful than his former Egyptian ruler. Okay. So him being a prince, Salilus, was like a co-general underneath or a, or a junior general. When Potomi's lost power, he came to power, okay, and he took the region of Syria, modern day Syria, okay, and then the second, the Selides, Selidites are identified with the kings of the north, and the Potomies are the kings of the south, so this here is the kings of the south, is the Egyptian area, and the kings of the north are the Syrian area. The dynasties of the Cellulites and the Protonies were fought for some 130 years. The stronger of the two always held dominion over the Holy Land. So there was Always, for 130 years, there was a conflict between the north, the kings of the north, the Salud Seeds, against the Potomies, who were the kings of the south. Okay. And the authority would wax and wane. Okay to who would rule the Holy Land at the time, and that was dictated by whoever was the stronger of the two. However, in verse 6 we see that there is a marriage between the families of the kings of the north and the kings of the south. Okay, And at the end of some years, they shall join forces, for the daughter of the king of the south shall go to the king of the north and make an agreement, but she shall not retain the power of her authority, and neither he nor his authority shall stand, but she shall be given up with those who bought her, and with him who begot her, and with him who sta strengthened her in this in those times okay so basically what happens here is quickly that there's a daughter that is born to the king of the south and she has a arranged marriage with the king of the north and she loses quite a bit of the power in the agreement but also the north the king of the north also has a bit of authority problems. So let's have a look and unpack that. They shall join forces. Joined by marriage, the king of the north and the south would be allies for a while, but the agreement would not last. The daughter of the king of the south shall go to the king of the north and make an agreement. This was fulfilled in the marriage between Antiochus the second, the Cellulites, Remember, and Beatrice, the daughter of Ptolemies, the first, the second. There was peace for a time because of the marriage, but it was upset when her father died, Ptolemy the second. Right. Shall not retain power of her authority. Once Ptolemy the second died, Antiochus, Antiochus, Antiochus II, right, 
divorced Beatrice and took back his former wife, Lodius. Okay. Neither he nor his authority shall stand. Lodius didn't trust her husband, Antiochus II, so she had him poisoned. Okay. And then she shall be given up with those who bought her after the murder of Antiochus II, Lodius and Beatrice with her infant son and her attendants were killed. So all three of them, all three women and the infant son were killed. Okay. Right. And then after this reign of terror, Lodius set her son on the throne of the Syrian dominion. Okay. Right. So, what an amazing tragedy of events. Just for the power of the Holy Land. Then in verse 7 to 9, we see from the south, an army defeats the king of the north. Okay, so. But from the branch of her roots, one shall rise in his place, who shall come from an army, enter the fortress of the king of the north, and deal with them and prevail. And he shall carry their gods captive to Egypt with their princes and their precious articles of silver and gold. And he shall continue more years than the king of the north. Also the king of the north shall come to the king kingdom of the king of the south, but shall return to his own land. So let's have a look, see and unpack this. Who shall come to with an army? The angel told Daniel that a branch of her root would come forth from the south, prevail other over other kings of the north. Okay. Right. So the deal with them and prevail, this was fulfilled in the person of Polonius the third, who was the brother of Beatrice. Okay. The branch of her roots. Okay. So remember, Beatrice was the princess that was given to the prince of the north, and she had a brother, and his name was Polonius the third. And he stayed back in Egypt while she ruled over the north. Okay, so avenging the murder of his sister, Polonius III invaded Syria and humbled Cyrus II, who came to power after this tragedy of tragic event of Yalodius' son is this guy, the Cellulus the second. Okay. So verse ten says the sons of the north and their victory. However the sons shall soon up stir up strife and assemble the multitude of great forces and one shall certainly come and overwhelm the past through them then he shall return to his fortress and stir up strife and the sons of the kings of the north would continue the battle one of the sons would conquer the holy land overwhelm and pass through which stood as a buffer between the kings of the south and kings of the north. Okay. So the land, the promised land of Israel 
of Jerusalem and the temple were a buffer between the north and the south. Okay. And then there was this was fulfilled in Seleucus the third and Antiochus the third, the two sons of Seleucus the second. Both were successful generals, but Seleucus the third ruled only for a short time, and then was succeeded by his brother Antiochus the third. In a famous battle, Antiochus the third took back the Holy Land from the dominion of the Ptolemies. Now the Ptolemies are the guys from the north, from the south. Okay. Right. The king of the south gains an upper hand over the king of the north. Verses 11 and 12. The king of the south shall be moved with rage and go out and fight with him, with the king of the north, who shall muster a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into his hand of his enemy. When he was taken away the multitude, taken away the multitude, his heart will be filled up, and he shall cast down tens of thousands, but he will not prevail. Okay. So the angel told Daniel, that the king of the south now would attack and meet a great multitude of soldiers from the north. The king of the north who lo would lose this battle and his multitudes would be defeated. Okay. So this was fulfilled when Antiochus III was defeated in the battle of Rapha. Okay. Because of that loss, he was forced to give back dominion of the Holy Land to Polymus the fifth, the fourth. Sorry. So here in verses thirteen and sixteen, the king of the north and his um, and his occupation of the glorious land. For the king of the north will return and muster multitudes greater than the former and shall certainly come at the end of some years with a great army and much equipment. Now in those times many shall rise up against the king of the south. Also violent men of your people shall exalt them and fulfill in, in the fulfillment of the vision that they shall fail or fall. So the king of the north shall come and build a siege map and take the fortified city and force and the forces of the south shall not withstand him. Even his choice troops shall have no strength to resist. But he who comes against him shall do accordingly to his own will and no and one shall stand against him. He shall stand in the glorious land with destruction in his power. The king of the north shall certainly come at the end of some many years with a great army. The angel told Daniel that the northern dynasty would answer back to the defeat of the king of the south and extended siege. This victory would give the king of the north dominion over the glorious land, which is another term for the promised land, and Jerusalem and the temple. The land of ornaments, that is Judah, which is lying betwixt or between those Two potent princes, okay, afflicted as corn on the ground, asunder lying between the two heavy millstones. That's what Trap said in this quote that the area was like a 
piece of corn between two heavy millstones. No one shall stand against him. This was fulfilled when Antiochus III invaded Egypt again, gaining final control over the armies of Ptolemies V and over the Holy Land. So eventually someone gets power and dominion over the Holy Land. Many shall rise against the king of the south. Okay. Jews living in the Holy Land helped Antiochus III defeat the king of the south. This was because the Jewish people resented the rule of the Egyptian Ptolemies. Because he was a violent person and he was violent against the people. Okay, and it says you are violent of your people shall exalt themselves in fulfillment of this vision. Okay. He who comes against him shall do accordingly to his own will, with destruction of his power. Okay, so here the Jewish people of the glorious land initially welcomed Antiochus III as their liberator from the Egyptian rule. Their decision to support Antiochus the third, however, proved unwise when he turned destruction upon the glorious land and his people. Okay. Right. So this, let's move on. Verse 17, the king of the south shall give his daughter to the king of the north. He shall also set face and enter with strength of his whole kingdom, and upright ones with him. Thus shall he do, and he shall give him the daughter of the woman to destroy it, and she shall stand with him, or be with him. The king of the north, who ruled over the Holy Land now, would also attempt to dominate and dis destroy the king of the south. Okay. He would make one more attempt by giving the king of the north the daughter of the woman to destroy. But this plot would not succeed. She will not stand with him. This was fulfilled when Antiochus III gave his daughter Cleopatra to Polynes the fifth, the fourth Jew, or the fifth to Egypt. He did this hoping to gain permanent influence and eventual control in Egypt. To the great disappointment of Antiochus III, the plan did not succeed because Cleopatra wasn't faithful to her Egyptian husband at all. Okay. Right. However, we need to remember that this is not Cleopatra of ancient history. However, this was a, a ancestor of her, the more famous Egyptian woman called Cleopatra lived a hundred years after the time of this Cleopatra. Okay. The kings of the north is stopped and stumbled, verse 18, 18 and 19, after he shall turn his face to the coastland and shall take many, but the ruler shall bring the reproach against them to an end, and with the reproach remove, he shall turn back to him, when he shall turn his face towards the foot fortress of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall, and not be found. After this disappointing effort through his daughter Cleopatra failed, the king of the north would turn his efforts towards the coastland until he was stopped by one formerly under reproach, until he shall stumble and fall and not be found. This was to fulfill Antiochus III's turn as he turns his attention towards the area of Asia Minor and Greece. 
Christ. Okay. He was helped by Hannibal, the famous general, okay, from Cartier, but a Roman general, Lucas Cornelius Scipio, defeated Antiochus in Greece. Antiochus planned to humiliate Greece, but was humiliated instead. He returned to his former region and lost all that he gained and died shortly after that. Okay. Right. So after this defeat, Antiochus III had a inglorious end. Needing money badly for his tragedy, he restored he was restored to pilgrimage in the Babylonian temple and he was killed by enraged local citizens. Okay. So that he comes to a sticky end. That is the last Greek um, area that was there. The brief reign of the succeeding king of the north, there shall rise in his place one who imposes taxes on a glorious kingdom, but within a few days he shall be destroyed, but not in anger or in battle. After this inglorious end of the king of the north, his successor raised the taxes to meet a soon end. This was fulfilled in the brief reign of Salimus III, the eldest son of Antiochus or Antiochus III. He sought to tax his dominions, including the glorious kingdom. So he put a tax on the Holy Land in order to increase his revenues, but it fell, and his plans to pillage the Jerusalem temple was set aside when his ambassador, uh, his ambassador had an angelic vision. So he was all ready to go and pillage and get some more temple treasures from the Jerusalem temple, but he was stopped by his ambassador, who had a vision. Within a few days he shall be destroyed. Then Sadilus the third was assassinated, which probably was by his brother Antiochus the fifth. Antiochus was known or known as Antiochus the Epiphanes, a vile person. He comes to power now. Okay. And we see that in chapter 8 when we unpack his reign of terror and his abomination and desolation of the temple. In his place shall rise a vile person to whom they will not give the honor or royalty, but he shall come in peaceful and seize the kingdom by intrigue. Okay. The angel told Daniel that after this brief reign of the former king of north, the next kingdom would be a vile, the next king would be a vile person. He would not be recognized as royalty, but shall take power by intrigue. So he was not anything to do with any heir or anything. He just saw an opportunity and he was a vile person and we will see how intriguing his reign to the throne was. Now, this was to fulfill the success of successor of Samuelus the third, named Antiochus. 
He did not come from the throne of legitimacy because it was strongly sus suspected that he murdered his older brother, the previous king. The other potential heir to the son of Sadius III was imprisoned in Rome. He shall come in peaceably apart from the murder of his older son. Antiochus, didn't use terror to gain power. He rather used flattery and smooth promises and intrigue. Okay, Clark says in this quote, he says, he flattered Aeneas, the king of Pergamus, and his brother, and got their assistance. He flattered the Romans and sent ambassadors to the court to gain their favour and to pay them the arrears of the tribute. And then he flattened the Syrians and gained their concurrence. Okay. Antiochus took the title of Epitomus. Epitomus meaning illustrious okay and others diversely called him epitomes which means madman okay. however in verse 22 to verse 27 this vile person fails to conquer the king of the south so here he actually, he shall act deceitfully. The angel of told Daniel that the new king of the north, this vile person of Daniel verse 21, 11 verse 21, would attempt to dis be a deceitful covenant with the king of the south. However, this would fail and there would be a great battle and would not change the balance of power. But he shall stir up his power. This was fulfilled when Antiochus Epitomes carried out or carried on the feud between the dynasties, okay, but also pretended to have friendship and alliances with them both, but caught them off guard. Despite massive a massive effort and an epic battle, Antiochus Epiphanes did not stand and his army was swept away. Okay, so the first footnote here we need to know about Antiochus Epiphanes is that the defeat of Antiochus Epiphanes at his second campaign against Egypt was important because Egypt beat Antiochus with the help of Rome. At the end of it all, Antiochus Epiphanes and his kingdom were under the dominion of Rome. Okay. The famous battle, the Roman, um, a famous battle when the Roman navy defeated the navy of Antiochus Epiphanes. After the battle, the Roman general drew a circle around Antiochus in the dirt and demanded to know if he would surrender and pay a tribute to Rome and demanded to know before he stepped out of the circle from the point. From that point on, there would be no doubt. Antiochus Epiphanes took his orders from Rome and was under the Roman dominion from then onwards. Okay. Then those who ate the portion of his delicacies shall destroy him. This was fulfilled in the treachery against Antiochus and his counselors. Okay, so he was a real vile, dangerous, manipulating um, 
deceitful character. But he did the grievous harm against the Jewish people and their nation and their temple. And we see that in verse 28 to 35. While returning to his land with great riches, his heart was so moved against the holy covenant, so he shall do damage and return to his land. At that appointed time he shall return and go towards the south, but it shall not be like the former or the latter, for ships from Sirius, Cyrus would come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return and rage against the holy covenant and do damage. So he shall return and show regard to those who forsake the holy covenant and, f and forces shall be mustered by him and they shall defile the sanctuary of the fortress and they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place their abomination of desolation. Those who do wickedly against the covenant shall he shall corrupt with flattery. But the people who knew their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. And those of the people who understood or understand shall instruct many. Yet for many days they shall fall by the sword and flame and captivity and plundering. Now when they fall they shall be aided with a little help and by many shall join them by intrigue, and some of these understandings shall fall to refine them, purify them, and make them white until the time of the end, because it shall be still for an appointed time. So here we see now that Antiochus Epiphanes is so despondent and so angry about his defeat from his from the Roman fleet and his armies are fleeing he even tries to attack Cyprus and they also defeat him and in his anger and his um, rage he decides to break the covenant that was set up, that was held by the covenant that Alexander the Great actually put out not to touch the Jewish people or their temple. He breaks that and he gets mad and he actually stops the daily sacrifices when he arrives in Jerusalem and then the abomination of desolation takes place there. So let's have a look and see if we can unpack that. His heart shall move against the holy covenant. When the vile person returned to his land, he would attack the land. People of the temple of Israel, at this time, of great courage and great treachery among God's people. Okay, so he shall damage and be and and return to his own land. This was fulfilled when Antiochus Epiphanes returned from Egypt, bitter from de defeat. He vented his anger against Jerusalem, which was already shaken because of Antiochus because Antiochus sold the office of the high priest and persecuted the Jewish people to conform to Greek culture and forsaking the faith of the traditionals of their fathers. So here he is already like, um, like executing and um, making laws that they need to become part of the Greek culture. 
and they need to forsake the traditions of their ancestral fathers, which is Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And while he was returning to his land with great riches, failing his invasion of Egypt, Antiochus Epiphanes returned home, only with great only with great plunder to loot his wounded pride. And then he comes across the ships from Cyprus shall come against him. This was a naval this was naval assistance from Rome who helped the Egyptians turn back Antiochus Epiphanes. Okay, so he gets defeated by the Romans there. And they shall take away the daily sacrifice and place the abomination of desolation. Here now, Antiochus Epiphanes set up an image of Zeus in the temple of Jerusalem at the altar. And he demanded the sacrifice to this image and later desecrated the temple by sacrificing a pig on it. It was a true, it was in truth an abomination which brought a desolation or a condition to the temple. For now, no one would worship at, it at, at all. Those who do wickedly against the covenant shall corrupt shall corrupt with with flattery, but the people who know their God shall be strong. When Antiochus Epiphanes returned or turned to Jerusalem and the Jewish people, I turned on, they were divided. Some forsook their covenant with God and embraced the culture. Those who knew their God made a stand of righteousness in face of incredible persecution. So there was major persecution here against the um, Jewish people at this time. Here we see how terrible it was. For many days they shall fall by the sword and flame, by captivity and plundering, in his attack on Jerusalem. Antiochus Epiphanes said to, he was said to have killed 80,000 Jews taken 40,000 more prisoners and sold another 40,000 as slaves. He had plundered the temple, robbed it of approximately $1 billion by modern calculation. Okay. Until the, end, the time of the end, because it is still for the appointed time, this terror could only last as long as God had appointed it. God had a purpose even for such persecution and blasphemy. So now, the last couple of verses, the last ten verses or so, we're going to see the Antichrist now, comparative, the end times. Okay, associated with Antiochus Epiphanes. Okay, so what he did, right, is going to be repeated in the future. The willful king, a shift to the future fulfillment of this. Okay, verse 36. Okay. Then the king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god. He shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished. For what has been determined shall be done. Okay, the angel explained to Daniel here now, in verse 36, that this king would blaspheme God and exalt himself until the wrath has been accomplished and what has been determined shall be done. Here, above every God, here we see the shift from what was fulfilled, okay, in 
the potomies and the cellular sides. Um, okay, what to what will be fulfilled in the Antichrist, the final world dictator. Okay, so here's the transition. Okay. Daniel was told that this revelation pertained to the latter days. Here in chapter 10 verse 14. Okay, so remember in my Bible study, you need to remember that. And then also in Daniel 11.36 now, which we're looking at now, begins to look more towards the final world dictator who is sought, is a, who is a sort of a last days Antiochus Epiphanes. Okay, so we need to remember this now. We know that everything about the prophecy was not fulfilled during the career of Antiochus Epiphanes. Because Jesus specifically said the real abomination of desolation is, was still in the future in Matthew 24 verse 15. And then Paul also paraphrased it or paraphrased Daniel 11 verse 36 which we're looking at now in reference with the coming Antichrist. And here in 2 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4, Paul now gives us what the future will hold with this future Antichrist, which is a foreshadow of the Antiochus Epiphanes. Let no one be deceived. No one deceive you by any means, for that day will come unless the falling away will first come first, and the man of sin is revealed, the man of perdition, who possesses and exalts himself above all that is called God, all that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, Showing himself that he is God. So this verse here, or these two verses, okay, are directly related to what Antiochus Epiphanes did here, and also related to what Jesus says in Matthew 24.15. Okay. Antiochus Epiphanes is important. You need to realize that. Okay. But mostly as a historical preview as the Antichrist. So when we look at the historical events of the Holy Land and we compare the scriptures of the Old Testament, it verifies the preview of an Antichrist to come. This is why so much space is given to describing the career of the evil man, the one evil man, because he prefigures the ultimate evil man. Antiochus Epiphanes is like the trailer, okay, released before the Antichrist, who is like the feature, okay. So we're getting, we've got a preview of the end times Antichrist in Antiochus Epiphanes. Okay. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god. Antiochus Epiphanes certainly did this in the general sense that all sinners opposed God. Yet he remained loyal to the Greek religious tradition, which revered the entire Olympian Pantheon. Antiochus Epiphanes 
put a statue of Zeus of Zeus in the temple, okay, and not of himself. This statement will be far more precisely fulfilled in the Antichrist who sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself he is God. Okay, so we need to understand that. So what actually happened was just the difference, just there's a slight difference between the characters of Antiochus Epiphanes, which is the preview of the Antichrist. The preview, okay, Antiochus Epiphanes puts a statue of Zeus and not of himself into the temple. Okay. Whereas in the future, the Antichrist assumes the position of God in God's temple. Okay. Shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished. The Antichrist will do much damage. But he is a, sh a short, he's on a short chain and will only work into God's plan. God's purpose will be accomplished. Okay. So the character and authority of the willful king, he shall regard neither the God of his fathers nor the desire of women no regard of any god, or he, sh or he shall exalt himself, for he shall exalt himself above, above them all, but in their place he shall honor a god of fortresses and a god which his fathers did not know. He shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things. This he shall act against the strongest fortresses with a foreign god. He shall acknowledge and advance its glory and he shall cause them to rule over many and divide the land for gain. Okay. He shall regard neither the God of his fathers nor the desire of women. Based on this particular verse, some Bible scholars believe that the Antichrist will be a Jewish descendant and perhaps will also be a homosexual. These things may not be popularly known about the man but they may be true nonetheless. But many commentators believe that the desire for women refers to Jesus, in that all women desire the honor of bearing the Messiah and understanding desire as it is used in Hagar chapter 2 verse 7. Seeing the desire of women, as Jesus makes most sense in the light of the flow of the context. Okay. And then the last portion, he shall honor the, a god of fortresses. The Antichrist will take and hold power with military might and the shrew and will show use of great riches. Okay. And then the final conflict, the last five verses, the final conflict. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a world, like a whirlwind, with chariots, horsemen, and with many ships, and he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. And he shall also enter the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape from his hand, Eden, Moab, 
and the and the prominent people of Ammon. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall have the power over the treasures of gold and silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt. Also the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall follow at his heels. But the news from the east and the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go out with great fury and destroy and annihilate many. He shall, he shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and no one will help him. Here the angel described to Daniel a confederation of kings coming against this great leader with a battle in the near a uh, uh, battle in and near the Holy Land. The king of the south shall attack him, the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. Prophetically speaking, a precise identification of these peoples mentioned is difficult. The king of the south may be Egypt or represented, representing the Arab community. The king of the north may be the Antichrist dominion. Okay. Or it may be Russia. Okay. Or Turkey region. The precise points may be cloudy, but a general, but the general idea is clear. The end will be marked by a great conflict, culminating in the world's armies gathering in the promised land to do final battle. Yet he shall come to his end and no one will help him. In the end, there is no hope for the Antichrist or for any of his followers. Folks, that comes to the end of chapter 11. And it covered, the first part it covered how the Greek Empire rose and through that rising rose one man who was the foreshadow of the Antichrist of the end times. And we see how the terminologies need to be opened up and seen. So what we see in the Greek Empire is a microcosm of what the end times will be. So the kings of the north are scaled down and the kings of the south are scaled down to the Greek Empire in the first part of this uh, vision. Okay. But the second part of the vision, the kings of the south and the kings of the north, are amplified as the reign of the end times under the Antichrist come against Christ. Okay, at the end times. Okay, so folks, as we reflect on this chapter, we need to remember that um, we need to rightly divide the word of truth. And we're seeing the signs of the times that are coming. And we need to be discerning. We need to take heed 
as Christ says, not to be deceived, and Paul says, not to be deceived at this time. Folks, I hope you enjoyed that, and we will continue with the final chapter of Daniel. And my apologies for taking so long and getting this out, but I needed to do a lot of research to bring it to this point. So I trust that you had a blessed lesson. Enjoy the rest of your day and the week. God bless.